since vain vain We call them the Amish. Shunning modern advancements, they drive horses and buggies and live without electricity. Where do they come from? Are they a culture? A religion? What made them who they are? This film series explores the inner workings of the Amish church, as told by some of their own who no longer wear black hats and bonnets. For 300 years, the Amish have been known as the silent in the land, now a growing number of them are breaking the silence. Hi, my name is Joseph Graber. I'm your host for this film series. For the first 14 years of my life, I grew up Old Order Amish. I know what it's like living without electricity and going everywhere with horses and buggies. When I set out to create this film project, I wanted to tell my parents' story and to share my perspective on this unique culture. And that's what we've done in the previous episodes. But my parents' story and my Amish history have had a huge impact on my life. And so in this episode, I want to take a moment to look at my journey. In many ways, my story begins here in the West Kootenai Valley in northwestern Montana. In the early 1990s, my family moved here from Missouri. I came as a little Amish boy, excited about life in the mountains. My family lived here in this house. It was here that I watched my father weather one of the worst storms of his life. We decided to follow Jesus, you know, that's what I decided. I, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. I mean, I'll. I'll follow Jesus in the Amish church, that's fine. But it'll be Jesus, it's not gonna be the cultural thing. Because I believe it really came down to the fact that we were aware that uh, we're either serving the Lord or we're serving culture and, uh, and tradition. If my father had not chosen to follow Christ and been excommunicated from the Amish church, he would still be in the Amish church today. I would be an Amish man, and my sons would be growing up in the Amish culture. But my father did choose to follow Christ, and we were excommunicated from the Amish church. Today, I am not a member of the Amish church. So what legacy can I pass on to my sons? This question started me on a journey like many other former Amish, I don't always know what to do with my Amish background. If your heritage has rejected you, is it still your heritage? Through the process of making this film, I did a lot of research and spoke with many people. Some were familiar with the Amish, others knew my family 20 years ago. But our time in Switzerland was perhaps the most helpful. As I learned more of the history of the Reformation era, it gave me a new perspective on my own spiritual journey. Many times the disagreeing factions here both called themselves Christians. A really good example of this is Zwingli. He translated the Bible into the language they understood. In fact, had a complete translation before Martin Luther did. And then his students and the people that were following him used the very Bible that he translated to disagree with him. During the Reformation era, standing for the truth contra mundum against the whole world, became first the ideal, as seen in men like Luther when he stood before the council and said, Unless you can convince me by scripture, and not by popes or councils who have often contradicted each other, unless I am so convinced that I am wrong, I am bound to my beliefs by the text of the Bible. I cannot and I will not Recant! Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Later, defending the truth, contra mundum, 
became almost an obsession. As each person or group rediscovered a the truth, they felt almost compelled to separate themselves from everyone else who did not immediately embrace it in the same way. While we were in Switzerland, we visited a number of castles that held Anabaptist prisoners during the Reformation era. The Castle Troxelwald, in particular, is still playing a part in the relationship between the Anabaptist descendants and the Reformed Church of Switzerland. Greetings from Switzerland. I'm Paul Vergus, pastor of the Reformed Church in the canton of Bern. I often visit this place, the Castle of Troxelwald. My ancestors were also some of those persecuted Anabaptists who came from this area here where the castle is standing. When I look at this castle, it's exciting to me. I love exploring it. I want to go up every stair and every tower. I want to look into every little room. Well, I want to take pictures of it. I want to explore every nook and cranny of it. But when my ancestors, the Graeber family and the rest of the Anabaptists, when they lived here in Switzerland, these castles were not necessarily a thing of beauty for them. In fact, for them, it was a symbol of terror sitting up on the hillside. They didn't want to come visit a castle. It was a place of gloom, a place of dread, a place where people died for their faith, a place where you were separated from your family for weeks and months, not knowing what was happening. When I'm here, then I feel actually the cloud of witnesses. I have a look to the prison tower from here. I see perfectly the barred windows where they sat in their cells. I feel the prayers of these people back there, all the endurance and all the strength it took faith to grow in this tough, in this hard environment. Because of the persecution that this castle and others like it represent, the early Graeber family moved from here in Switzerland to what is today France, where they had more freedom at that time, before eventually moving on to America. In this valley and throughout this whole area here near Hutville is where my Graeber ancestors lived at one time before they uh, moved to France and eventually America. According to Ora Graeber's history of the Graeber immigrants to America, Peter Graeber moved here and in, the, in the late 1700s and he built this house and he built a barn here and he began farming here. We're up on a high hill, it's a beautiful place. getting to the end of the journey here in Switzerland and France and we're about to head home. I'd like to come back, I'd like to spend more time. I really want my sons to grow up with a better understanding of their heritage. And if at all possible, I want to bring them back here, I want to show them these places. But I want us to understand history and what were the causes and effects that led things to be where they were in order to better understand the present. But I do feel a lot closer to the history now. I feel close to the leaders of the Anabaptists that were over here that were being hunted down and killed. Sitting in that prison in the castle the other day and just sitting there for a while really made it come real to me. It may have helped that Peter was at the end of himself and was crying, especially when he saw chains on me, he wanted to get out of there. And so it helped it feel a little more real, what it would be like to be so helpless. This is a thought I've always had with me, and uh, it turns out, I think, to be true, mm -hmm. that if you are imprisoned, you develop like a mentality. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot get rid of that, if you cannot be reconciled, with the roots of your history and the tragedies that took place, sometimes you start to imprison 
yourself, your people. Mm -hmm. And uh, having been a victim, you then move on to be the one who makes victims or who mm -hmm. suppresses others. And this is what I saw, that then they do not have stones or, or shackles. They have laws and orders and rules and stuff like this. But it, exactly the same thing happens. When Jacob Amon came from Alsace area down here to the Emmental, he was coming here to try to impose his will on other people. He wasn't respecting Hans Reist and the other ministers of this area. He was coming to tell them what to do and wanting to use religion to control others. And I don't want that. I don't think that's a good part of my heritage. By upholding those traditions in such a strict manner, they produced a new prison. This is very strange. This was not a prison consisting in rocks or timbers and bars, but it was a spiritual prison. And the people who were kept in there had a hard time to escape. It was almost impossible to get out of this new prison. There was a lot of people caught in the Amish church that are not there because they want to be there. They're there because their parents were there, their grandparents were there. They believe it's the right thing to do to be there. And uh, I believe they're misinformed, but that they think it's the right thing. So a lot of people are caught. Excommunication and shunning is the fabric that holds the culture together. Take that away and you don't have an Amish culture. Mm. It holds it together. It has held it together all these years. It was so almost haunting to see that starting here, where they had so much freedom, but instead of, they didn't want to become like the people they were with, and so they began making rules. And that was when I think they made the huge mistake of, they, they, they thought that uniformity would bring unity. You know, from the outside, when you see uniformity, it looks and sometimes even feels like unity, but it's not unity. It just means that they look the same, and so they can still have a lot of of uh, disagreement among them. From the days of Jacob Amon until now, excommunication and shunning does seem to be a theme of many Amish stories. So when I heard something about a group of Amish going to Switzerland for reconciliation, I went to the Amish community in Liddy, Montana to learn more. We got to Lloyd Miller's house last night about 4.30. Before we ate supper with them, I interviewed Lloyd outside well, when we first came, we thought we were, we'd just have a better Amish community. Okay. But we got intercepted by the Holy Spirit in 1995. Mm -hmm. And that dramatically altered the, uh, the path we were on. And for, from 1995 to 2002, I was personally able to go into the Amish church and bring the message of the gospel mm -hmm. freely because the doors were open. Yeah. And when they shut the doors to us, our hearts never turned away from them. So by 2001, 2002, the Amish had pretty much uh, cut ties with us. Did they officially excommunicate you? They did not. There was never an excommunication because we were a sovereign group at that time. Okay, yes. I was already the leader, the bishop. So they could just disfellowship. So they just disfellowshiped us. Our heart was never to leave them. In the last several decades, there has been a growing awareness in Switzerland of what happened 500 years ago. As a result of this, there was a group of people in Switzerland who were praying and asking God for mercy for their country, and they wanted to ask forgiveness and try to reconcile with the descendants of the Anabaptists that had been driven from Switzerland. Soon after the encounter with the Holy Spirit, a former Amish Mennonite couple who were part of the leadership called Watchmen for the Nations met us in a conference in Canada. And Watchmen is a Canadian-based ministry that goes worldwide, bringing the Father's heart and nations together. And they certainly brought it to us. And so we were invited up to Canada. We went there in 2001. It started with a prayer movement in, in Canada and uh, some Swiss pastors and also Ben Giro's there, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were brought together 
there was a prophet from Egypt working there and he had an impression that uh, something is going on between the old churches of Europe and the Anabaptists. The delegation from Switzerland was asking, is there anyone with an Anabaptist heritage that we can connect with? Are there any Anabaptists in America or Canada that we could connect with because we're finding this information in our libraries about what happened on Swiss soil mm. in the 1500s? Wow. They wanted to pursue reconciliation, but they had one problem. Among the Old Order Amish, descendants of the Anabaptists that they wanted to reconcile with, there was no one that would talk with them because those who were still Old Order Amish didn't want to talk with outsiders. And those who had left didn't want to identify as Amish and represent the Amish. And so the group from Libby, Montana was a real answer to prayer. They identified as Amish and they were willing to participate in reconciliation. They saw that they're not able to handle their own splittings without going back to the roots and forgiving uh, the people of the state church. Mm -hmm. They still have anger, bitterness, things like this in their hearts. They will uh, repeat and multiply their own splittings among their own people all the time. So to get healed from this addiction to, to splitting, mm -hmm. uh, to overcome that, they have to go back to the place where the first split took place. This is go back to Switzerland. The group from Switzerland actually sponsored for a group of Amish and Mennonites from America to join them in Switzerland. Because they said, we put you out of our country. We banished you and we're going to pay your way back. And we're going to apologize nationally for what happened to your fathers. Forty of our group here made the journey over there. Ben Giro was here and the people from Zurich pastors were here, other pastors were here, uh, the governor was here and they were forgiving. We have failed. We were wrong. And you are right. I forgive you. Ich euch vergebe. This is like a, a milestone. Mm -hmm. That word exists. Yes. <laughs> yes, milestone. A milestone of, of uh, church history mm -hmm. and of, uh, uh, of building one body in the kingdom of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then we had following conferences uh, in different places in America. And finally, we had, I think I was 07. Uh, this open air. I saw the open air, yeah. yes. We had 10,000 uh, attendees during mm -hmm. these three days. Uh, so this was a huge impact. Yes. In 2007, mm -hmm. there was this Teufeljahr. It was a good time for us. Okay. For example, here in this place, mm -hmm. where uh, it's his historical, very important, I think, mm -hmm. we never could speak with the state church mm -hmm. about this matter before, really. Uh, perhaps sometimes they tried, but it never came a connection. Mm -hmm. And it was good for us here. For us, for our church, yes. it was good, but it was also very good for the state church yes. to speak together. And I think it's, it's near since, mm -hmm. since this time. Finally, it was uh, like a mass movement. Mm -hmm. Many, many people came. Today, I choose to follow you. The year of the Anabaptists had a huge impact on all those who were part of it. But on all sides, there are people who don't really know what's happening. In 2014, Pastor Paul traveled to the United States to try to connect with one such group, the Old Order Amish. I was uh, a few weeks in the States just to meet Amish bishops and to ask them for uh, forgiveness what the state of Bern was uh, doing to their, to their ancestors. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this trip brought me to many Amish in Kentucky and uh, Indiana and uh, upstate New York and many places. Mm -hmm. I never got a glass of water in an Amish home. 
And in one case, I could enter a home of an Amish people. Mm -hmm. Usually, they would come out, talk with me a little bit, uh, being, being bewildered somehow. Bewildered, yes. Bewildered, and okay. then uh, say goodbye. Mm -hmm. This was my experience. So they would no, not I was you like in. cast out, like we did to them, mm -hmm. they did to me. Many Anabaptist descendants, especially among the Amish, are so bound up in their new prisons of rules and ordinances and religious control that they're unable to hear the message of forgiveness and to receive it. But for those of us who are able to hear the message of forgiveness and to receive it, there is great freedom and these are exciting times. Today, Troxoval is becoming a symbol of hope again because of the many splits that had happened here with the Anabaptists, Jacob Amon, Hans Reich, this, the Reformed Church. Today, it's all coming back together. Reconciliation has been happening. We're recognizing that now we are various parts of the body, like the hand and a foot, and we're different like that. Instead of killing each other because we're different, we're now embracing our differences. And there is, we're finding some unity and diversity. And so the castle Troxelwald has become a symbol of reconciliation and hope for the future instead of a symbol of dread and gloom. Why now? Why, why in the last 10 years has there been some reconciliation? Maybe it's, it's again a time of favor God is giving for reconciling the reconciliation movements. Uh, all around. Mm -hmm. Many places, many churches, many denominations are called into this move and it's from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Just like Reformation time, mm -hmm. this was a big move of the Holy Spirit and mm -hmm. he, he tries to bring people to the point where they do the first thing we promise God in the Lord's Prayer, that we forgive. Mm -hmm. This is the only thing we, we promise in this prayer mm -hmm. and with this forgiveness everything can start. Mm -hmm. And if we stop there, nothing can start. Mm -hmm. This is the point. When I was growing up, I was under the impression that it was the Catholic Church that was persecuting my Anabaptist ancestors. But for the most part, it was actually the Reformed State Church that was persecuting my ancestors. Because both of these churches are still in existence today, it can be very difficult for people who share my Anabaptist heritage to forgive them. While on the journey of making this project, I learned some things that gave me a different perspective on some aspects of my Anabaptist heritage. One example of this is something that the Catholic Church has done in an attempt to be reconciled with its past. The sad fact is that we have had to wait until really the pontificate of John Paul II in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, early 2000s, and his desire was to heal these old wounds, which of course at that point were 500 years old. And so he took it upon himself to visit different communities of Protestants, descendants of these early Reformation movements, and make apologies for horrific things that were done on the Catholic side. The, perhaps the greatest example is that John Paul II visited a community of uh, Bohemian Christians who were descendants of Jan Hus, or as we say, John Hus in English. John Hus was a Catholic priest and an early reformer. He eventually gave up on reform within the Catholic Church and left. And the bishops gathered at the Council of Constance in the 1400s, invited Jan Hus to come and defend his positions and promised him safe passage home if he would do that. He arrived at Constance, attempted to defend his position, and he was arrested and put to death. And so John Paul II went to Bohemia and apologized 500 years later uh, for this uh, very offensive breaking of the word by Catholics. As I've been speaking with different people, it seems that many of the people who, like my father, made the first step out were very wounded yeah, of uh, because of all everything that came against them where I was protected because my father was the point man. He was the one going first and I followed in his tracks. Yeah, okay. The wounds didn't come to me. Yeah. 
And things that happened in my life over the years, there were people that I would never forgive for any what they did. You know, just you just kind of forget them. You just kind of push them aside. But I'm not going to forgive them. They were wrong. They were just wrong, and they can just go suffer. It, you know. But uh, God spoke to me, and um, I realized, oh my goodness, we're going to have to forgive these people. We had to release them in our heart. And I remember quite a long list of people that I wrote down, people that had over the years in some way or another offended me or hurt me or just that I felt was not right. You know, I had bishops' names on there, I had my parent, my dad's name was on that list. And it went through each one, forgave those people. I got a freedom that I never had before. And it just really released me. I believe God had got us ready for that. I was able to forgive everybody. They weren't hurting us, they were hurting the Lord. If they were against us, they weren't against us, they were against the Lord. That's what we saw by that time. And uh, so it was easy to um, just roll that burden on the Lord, and not, uh, not let it get us. Here at the door of uh, the castle, we can explain how church history works all the time. One principle is the following one. If you lock someone out, and close the door behind his back. Don't forget, you're locking yourself in. Now for the ones locked in and being kept in prison, in spiritual prison, prison of legalism, of principles, of orders, of regulations, etc. They have the key in their own hand, at least one of the keys. And they can do much for their liberation by their own. They just have to know that they're the ones who turned the key when they were shunning, banning others. So by opening the door, they would respect forgiveness in understanding of other people, of other ways to follow Christ, to believe in Him. So uh, there's no reason why those doors sh should not be opened wide in the future. This is a short address to all those who still are working and maybe not came to an end with their tragic history of persecution among the Amish people. Instead of using religion as a barrier to try to keep us safe, and that's what we do with religion a lot, we try to use it to make doors um, often to keep ourselves safe and that's wrong, that's not right. We should use our relationship with God to draw other people to Him, not as a way to separate us off from everyone else. His power is strong enough that there is security and peace in Him. He is our fortress. He is our strong tower. We don't have to try to build our own protective space. Centuries ago, some of my ancestors moved into areas in the Alsace and other places where they were encouraged, yes, sometimes even threatened, and told, you can come live here. You can live out your faith, you can farm, you can do all of this, but you must not proselytize. And so my ancestors went from being flaming carriers of the gospel of Jesus Christ to being the quiet in the land. People who farmed, people who had big families, people who were faithful, religious church attenders, but people who did not share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we say to the, to the Amish, don't throw away the values that came down through your parents. God is calling you back to the place of the faith of our forefathers who knew what the blood of Jesus did for them and spoke about it, who had a testimony and who loved not their lives unto death. And I call it the inheritance that is given to us from times gone by. We have a responsibility to take this and to share it with those around us and with the world, to break this silence and to break that, that vow we made that that our fathers made in Europe that we would not evangelize, we would not speak of our faith in exchange for no persecution, social status, and wealth. 
The Reformation was aborted because we compromised. But God is wanting to restore and to heal and to reconcile us back to Him to become once again the shining light proclaiming His name throughout the entire earth. To be proclaiming the name of the Lord and and experiencing and expressing the glory of God throughout the entire earth. That's our heritage that belongs to us. Let's not trade it just to maintain a certain culture and stay in a safe zone. I was in that prison tower the other day and I started trying to figure out how much scripture would I be able to quote if I didn't have the actual Bible in my hand. How, how much would I be able to quote? I got to handle a, a Christoph Rochard Bible today from several hundred years ago. And it was a big Bible. And as I was flipping those pages and looking at that, I, I thought, you know, this was not practical. You didn't, as you were on your way out to prison or on your way out to work or whatever was happening, you didn't just stick one of these Bibles in your pocket. You had to like have a table to hold the Bible. You didn't even sit on a chair necessarily and hold the Bible in your hand. You had to have a table to hold this gigantic Bible. Then you had to sit there and read it. And you needed to memorize it. You needed to know what was in it if it was going to help you. When I was nine years old, my parents gave me this little German New Testament. I remember taking it to school, and after I'd be finished with my lessons, I would sit there and begin to read it. There was something about it. It was my third language. I was struggling to be able to pronounce the words. But on Sundays, I would see my uncle and my dad and the other ministers would be reading from the Bible. And it would, they had the German Bible, and there was something holy about the scripture, and I wanted that. I would go outside and I would read it whenever I could, and, and if I couldn't go outside because it was winter time, I would go up in my loft and I would hide up there and use a flashlight and I would read the Bible. I'd learn how to pronounce the words. I really didn't know what I was reading, but I, somehow the sound of the words rolling over my tongue made me feel more holy, and I hoped that maybe, maybe, if I would read enough of the Bible on Sundays, some of that holiness would rub off on me. I heard my parents talking. My dad was telling my mom that my best friend, Marion, had on a Saturday morning in their house gone to his parents and said, okay, I want to be a Christian. And he had prayed with his parents and now he was a Christian. I wanted that so bad. I wanted to know that I was a Christian. In 1994, I knelt here in this living room with my parents and surrendered my life to the Lord. My father's faith was transferred to me, and the faith of our fathers took on a whole new meaning for me. Later that morning, I was outside, and I looked up and I saw my friend Marion riding his horse coming out of the National Forest woods. And as he rode up to me, all I could think of was, both of us are saved. How did your Amish family and friends react? What were some of the things that happened? We would uh, continually get it, get letters from back east. Well, one thing was we were so far far separated from our our close relatives, but they I guess would hear stuff through the grapevine and and uh, they would write us. I mentioned a couple times that that Eli and Marion gave their hearts to the Lord, mm. and then. Later, when I said that, or wrote back that they were baptized, one of them said, oh, well, I thought they were baptized before. Mm. And that was because they connected that giving their hearts to the Lord was automatically being baptized. Ah, okay. You know, so that made me aware of that we never say that in the Amish. You never say that somebody has accepted the Lord in their heart. From that point on, my friend Marion, his brother Eli, and I started spending a lot of time together. We all three of us had made a profession of faith, 
and we became close friends. After we left the Amish and were going to the community church, we would all meet after church and we would pray together. God was really working in us. Our boys grew up around that and at present Eli is the pastor there. In spite of what the Amish told us that our, our kids are all going to go wild and, and we're here to say proudly and honestly that our kids have all given their hearts to the Lord. The summer I was 15, after a special service here in this sanctuary, my father came to me, he hugged me, and for the first time in my life, he told me that he loved me. I was so deeply moved, I went up there to the altar. I knelt down and I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ for life, for ministry, for his purposes. I wanted to follow God the way my dad was following God. One of the reasons why we're making this project is to help people understand the heritage and what it was because um, in the days of Zwingli and Mons and Gribble and Blorock and on down with all, you know, all the different leaders along the way, at first it was, it was we want people to have the Bible in their language and be able to read it and decide to follow Christ. Okay. And again, with my father, that had to happen again. Mm -hmm. Say, no, every man, it's not enough for us to tell you. You must read the Bible and understand for yourself and make that decision. Today, we're breaking the silence. My dad went first. Salvation doesn't depend on good works or living a certain lifestyle or obeying church rules or wearing certain clothes. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ. We are all sinners and have fallen short of the glory of God. In Christ, our past is forgiven and erased. We become a whole new creation, a whole new life. We cannot earn our salvation or our right to go to heaven or our right to be born again. It is a free gift of God to those who are willing to receive it as the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. I get to follow in those footsteps. I am so blessed to have this as part of my heritage. Yeah, this is a true uh, heritage. Mm -hmm. This is what they forget. They say heritage and they mean the way they built houses, the way they cook cookies, the way they wear suits and stuff. That's heritage to their understanding. But heritage is uh, being in the footsteps of those who... Uh, I say always uh, this is a place where the cloud of witnesses can be touched. Mm -hmm. And uh, the heritage is to know the witnesses and to, to go into their cloud. Yes. And for, for Amish and Mennonites, the heritage, they're always talking about heritage. They mean something different. But we mean the actual heritage would be those steps in faith into freedom and casting or breaking all yokes and uh, going this path of forgiveness and being led by the Holy, Holy Spirit in, in, in uh, new ways the Lord wants to, to lead them not just uh, withstanding this, uh, the spirit of what he is talking to them. This is the heritage. Amen. It's also like um, uh, faith is more worth than life, and love is stronger than death. Those two sentences are for me perfectly what the true heritage is of the Anabaptists. And it was here at the Montpellier farm that Peter Graeber had helped build. I actually got to get a piece of stone. I have a piece of the wall of the original house and barn, like I, from where the kitchen used to be. How about the big one? Mm. I'm a blessed man to have been able to come here and walk in the houses of my ancestors, see the places where they lived, and to see some of my spiritual heritage. I'm very blessed. This then is my heritage. Men reading scripture for themselves in their own language, pursuing and seeking out the truth. 
And once they understand choosing to follow Jesus Christ, 500 years ago in Switzerland, men were surrendering their life to Jesus Christ and saying, whatever you want of me, I believe in you. My father did that. He read the word of God. He understood what the Lord wanted of him. And he surrendered his life. And then he passed that heritage down to me. My moment was here in this sanctuary, surrendering my life to him here. That's what my ancestors did. And that's what my father did. That really is the faith of my fathers. One of the things that I've realized on this journey is that the faith of our fathers is not good enough, as long as it remains the faith of our fathers. It has to be our faith. We, individually, each one of us, have to realize that there is a God in heaven who created the heavens and the earth. We, each one of us, individually, must open God's word and read it. And each one of us must personally surrender our life to Jesus Christ. And then, once the faith of our fathers is our faith, then it's good enough. But it has to be alive. It has to be ours. And so this is part of the heritage that I have received from my fathers that I get to give down to my children. So how about you? Is the faith of your fathers just the faith of your fathers? Or have you personally examined the evidence? Have you come and looked at the word of the living God? And have you discovered that there is a God in heaven who loves you, who sent his son to die for you? And have you gone to the cross of Jesus Christ and surrendered your life to him? Because then you too can share in my heritage.